That's not, not the problem. Nuts. The problem is that you're smiling. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my All favorite right, fan. Serious face. Welcome back, everyone, to the stories of the week for this edition of Security Weekly. We, of course, have in studio Mr. Jason Street, the awkward hugger himself. He's he's been like this the entire break, by the way. Just so you know, <laughs> I want to make it extra awkward. Day. Mr. Michael Santar Colangelo is on the line, who I only hope would come to the studio and hug me so lovingly as Jason's been yes. hugging me tonight. <laughs> you clear out that snow, I'll think about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe in the summer. In summer, maybe. get some chowder. Ah, uh, yes. It's, uh, very nice to have you here with us uh, tonight, Michael. And, of Thanks, course, sir. the regular cast and crew is with us, and we're going to talk about stories for the week. Where do you guys want to start? Of course, mine are kind of somewhat embedded device security focused and sponsors. sponsors. Then the stories of this week is actually brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Black Hills Information Security, the leaders in penetration testing and active defense. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to request a quote today. And by Black Squirrel, pen test networks from your browser. Exploit the limits of network security through just a browser. Have a Chrome exploit in your toolkit? Good. But for the rest of us, there's Black Squirrel. Visit blacksquirrel.io for more information. Where do you want guys to want to go? You want to talk Lizard Squad? Do you want to talk... Extracting stuff from RAM. Do you want to talk uh, abusing Blu-ray players? What do you think? Crickets. Let's go with the Blu-ray player. Yeah, the Blu-ray player I think might be the most interesting. Let's go with a Blu-ray. It's a Blu-ray. I hacked a Blu-ray player (laughs) and I put malware in the system. I don't know what they put in this pizza, but it was really good. They put a a (laughs) sidecar in my drink. It's really sour. All right, who's talking about Blu-ray? I don't know. <clears throat> Carlos, why don't you start us off? It sounds like you read this article. It's probably no, more than in fact, I haven't. I just saw a couple of tweets on it. Supposedly, the library actually executes Java code that's as part of the standard that they're using uh, when reading Blu-ray discs. That's what well, I got from the tweets on it. Yeah. The, the great thing about Blu-ray is it's not like it's in any embedded platforms that there's no real way to secure or update and patch. Oh, well, never mind. Well, unless you have an Xbox <laughs> and a PlayStation. No way. Oh, wait. Well, there's a, <laughs> we're completely screwed with Blu-ray because of the way it brought it. Uh, oh. Well, there's a couple of vulnerabilities, Jack. One is on the CyberLink Power DVD software, and the other is on physical Blu-ray players that would uh, be in laptops that were produced three years ago. Did, does any, does that, how many com- computers or laptops come with Blu-ray players on them? I've got one, actually. Yeah, got my Toshiba actually. from a couple of years ago had one. I've got an Alienware, well, yeah, and I'm about to be getting a Sager that's got a Blu-ray burner in it. Yeah, nice. So, so it's still pretty common. Yeah. I but, see but the, the whole <clears throat> miniaturization thing, some people have done without any kind of optical media these days. So I think the trend is sort of headed in that direction. But So here's uh, the yeah. thing, right? Larry I and I, were, have, I don't know if we were on the air when we were talking, but Larry and I were talking about <laughs> DVD players and also Blu-ray players. And when we teach SANS classes, the, traditionally SANS classes, the labs uh, have been, uh, you know, the VMs we put on DVDs. Right. But then we start noticing, like people, are like I don't, I don't have a DVD player. <laughs> like I'm, I'm my MacBook in. Air, does, like where's yeah. the DVD player? Yeah. I think maybe if I, no, there's no DVD yeah. player. So we transition to USB. Um, yeah, I, that, that's sitting, the point I was trying to make. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I love yeah. man. I'm sitting in front of two very powerful Ultra books uh, that neither has uh, optical media. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, optical media is sort of being phased out in in, in these boxes today. I mean, Blu-ray so passe, right? Everybody's streaming now. So. It, it's sort of sad, actually, because, you know, the person who actually, you know, broke this out and was like, yes, we've got this great vulnerability that no one's using anymore. I know. It's a <laughs> bummer, <laughs> right? Oh. It's like, this would have like been three awesome year, three, three years, years ago. ago. We <laughs> this would have been awesome. Everybody. Yeah. I mean, I if mean if it's still could, pretty cool. If we could cue the sound effect from the end of the Pac-Man game right there. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> yeah. yes. I, that was a very poor approximation, but... Anyway. We catch we catch your drift, Joff. So yeah, it, it's cool research. You should go read the link in yeah. in the show notes. But again, in practice, 
you know, USB. It's, and it's interesting, you know, someone said it, uh, when Joff said it's all about streaming now. Yep. And I've always thought that a really large attack vector, so <clears throat> I've had a Netflix account for some time, which, of course, went from DVDs to pretty much right. streaming. Um, I've got the Amazon Prime, <coughs> so I use that to watch movies. And now I just subscribe to a Hulu account. Right. Which gives you yet different content, which is kind of sad that we have to have three different <laughs> exactly. streaming providers. Yeah. But my point is all three of those are automatically charging my credit card every yeah. month. Yep, yep. And somehow linked to a payment. To, well, Amazon's the kind of the exception. They don't actually charge per month. You pay for Prime on a yearly basis. And then you have a PIN when you go buy, if you want to buy a movie, like there's stuff right. that's included. Then when you go buy a movie, you got to put a PIN number in and it links and charges your credit card. So all three of those are tied to some sort of payment method and they're wildly popular now. Right. Like when I used to talk about a Roku player or streaming Netflix or Amazon or Hulu, everyone would look at me that like wasn't in, uh, you know, computer geek, but look at me like, what are you talking about? Right, exactly. And now everyone's like, oh yeah, I use, in fact, um, one of my friends is like, now. yeah, dude, you got to check. He's like, you got to have a Hulu card. It's like, it's only like 8 or $9 a month. He's like, yeah. you, you got to have it. One thing I don't like about the Hulu Plus is the commercials. I, I was thinking the same thing. Exactly. So I, I fired it up last night, and it was actually able to read my Roku information right. and charge me through my Roku account. Whoa. Yeah, which is scary. So that's like, <laughs> I think there's a whole attack vector in attacking yeah. these things because it's tied to payments in some way, shape, form, or fashion. But... um. Yeah, I didn't like to fight. I'm paying eight dollars a month or whatever it is, and I gotta watch commercials. Yeah, and they're like commercials for all their shows on. Yeah, and you Hulu. can't fast forward. Yeah. yeah, and you can't. I haven't tried to fast forward. It's like I've, I've been able to fast forward to those. It's like, I mean, it's one thing that gets. If me. I pay for content, I don't want to have to watch an ad. Well, it's like the DVD right? thing. It's like you buy DVDs. It's like I go through the trouble of actually buying a DVD, <coughs> and then I have to look at the FBI warning, and I have to look, look at the, at the and previews. I can't, I can't go to the top menus. Yeah. I got to go look at the, the previews, and I've got to look at this, and I'm like, screw it. I can just rip it and stuff. You know, I buy the DVD, I just rip it rip immediately, it and then stream so it. I just, yeah, I can just watch it without, without having to go through all that crap. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, well, but that's the, like this show. I, we I, have I, ads on this show, but you could. This show is free, yeah, right? Exactly. Like that is it's free. You don't have to you don't buy pay the for content, it. right? That's the whole so thing. So there's with some Hulu. ads. Hulu yeah. is like you're paying for the the privilege of getting a commercial so since in, you interrupting yeah. your your show. Well, I mean, since all these services, and this is sort of counter to security to some degree, but since all these services have moved to a streaming model. Um, you know, the advertisers are having a real hard time, right? Because the, in in the whole cable model world, they they had the ability to put that content on, and and you had to watch it. And then DVRs came along, and then you got screwed because everybody had fast forward. And th now you got the streaming model that you select what you want when you want, and you know, yeah. you, they're really losing their channel. Is what's happening. But um, yeah, it's tough. But uh, on to a security story, Paul. What's next? Yes. So anyway, I still think. Have you ever heard about research that looks into hacking the payment systems in those particular services? No, but I'm pretty sure they're out there. Yeah, like and, we probably, <laughs> and we probably oh. don't know about them. Yeah. Yeah. That's Anyway, that was my tie into security. If anyone knows of that, please Excellent. tell me. Yeah, we'd love to hear because... Uh, are you, are you just... fishing for free Hulu account? Is that, is that, what, yeah. is that what I'm hearing here? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm sort of like going like, okay, he's going from a security standpoint, but, but is he saying that he needs some, uh, <laughs> some free hookups? Or it's I, like... I think he's being a Hulu ho. <laughs> That's right. I want everyone's Hulu <laughs> accounts, Netflix accounts, exactly. Amazon passwords, oh. yes. That's awesome. Hey. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, you want to talk about? Let's talk about Twitter. Oh yeah. Oh, that's the wrong I link in there. Oh no. Life okay. There. I like so you live tweet your life. Um, so apparently the Twitter triples their abuse team. Have you guys noticed a significant decrease in the amount of nasty stuff you get? No, I'm still no. getting those tweets from my mother. It's like uh, they haven't stopped yet. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently yeah. there was a, a boss at Twitter called Dick Costello, and he's quoted as saying, and I quote, we suck at dealing with abuse and trolls on the platform, <laughs> and we've sucked at it for years. That's his quote, dude. It, it was an internal, here, right it was here, internal, internal and it was, yeah. uh, it was overdue, and I think it was, it was great that they um, yeah. have admitted this problem, especially since they've become more financially focused, and they've, you know, it's not the Twitter it used to be five years ago, uh, but this, um, I don't know that I've seen a difference that I've noticed yet, but they've added a lot of people. They're responding a lot faster to uh, abuse complaints. Now, Jack, you, you live in the um, Ma uh, Boston area, right, Massachusetts. Did you hear about the Kurt Schilling thing? 
Yes. Yeah. So I'm curious, what are your thoughts on it? It was interesting to listen to talk radio because I listen to a sports network that's based out of Boston. And it was interesting to start. All of a sudden, I turn it on. They weren't talking about the Red Sox. They weren't talking mm-hmm. about the Patriots, the Bruins, the Celtics. They were talking about Twitter trolls. Yeah. It was absolutely <laughs> hilarious they, they, to they hear them. They were talking about Schilling's uh, broadcast uh, recording studio fraud thing. They, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things that I think don't think people realize anymore it's like twitter has gone from being that niche social networking for geeks and it's actually done things you know from the so Arab they Spring. labeled it but they labeled it jason as something that a much younger teenage generation uses and that's the only people that use twitter are like well the, i mean i act like a 12 year old but that doesn't mean it's a 12 year old like, <laughs> girl specifically <laughs> on twitter okay. i'm a 12 year old girl on twitter <laughs> It's nice of you, Jason. Actually, actually, no. Actually, one of my personas is a 23 year old accountant female. Uh, I, on Twitter. I see. <laughs> it's like Interesting. Sort of. Bet but, you get um, a lot of followers there. But exactly. But the key thing is, it, it's it's beyond that and stuff. You know, so you do have it to is. do a little bit more regulation. You have to. Well, do we've been using it in security for, for a long time. Oh, yeah, and boy, do we know how to troll. And, and boy, do we, <laughs> do we troll know to, with the best of them. <laughs> exactly. God damn it! It's like step up your game. <laughs> yeah. It's like, have you seen some of the tweet flame wars that have gone on on Twitter? It's like Jack Daniels. Well, the whole been the Kurt Schilling thing was yeah. Ridiculous. I mean, they they crossed the line. It's it's one thing when it's one thing when Amrit or Rob Graham or or Davi (laughs) or me. There's a whole list. There's a whole laundry list. When we're having fun, right? You know, when uh, when we're trolling, and we, for the most part, (laughs) we know each other and we know who's trolling. Um, It's another thing to. Be vile and disgusting and threatening towards people to, uh, you know, threaten rape or murder to um, release private information, dox people. Right. Uh, especially if they're uh, in a position of weakness, whether they're already a victim of something, whether they're uh, juvenile, uh, you know, something like that. Some, uh, And, you know, this was a case where... Um, some, but some folks were being idiots because they were screwing with somebody's <clears throat> kids, right? right. And yeah. he, at some point in time, um, you know, many of us understand that. Screw with my kids. Let's see how this ends up. Yep. I got, you know, oh, yeah, I got a shovel, got, a pickup truck, and that. a buddy with a pig farm. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, no, it, but it, Mike, I want, I want to get your, your take on this, too. I don't know if you've been privy to some of the news happening here in, uh, in the Boston area, but Schilling was kind of praised by some, but criticized by others because he went after these people. He mentioned their names publicly. Yeah, yeah. he went after these people. Is, is that it, it, What's your kind of take on that story, given the, the fact now that you know that uh, Schilling went after these uh, these folks? So you came to the Yankees fan to ask that question. Because <laughs> if you noticed in Schilling's stuff, he's like, look, there's people who hate me, and that includes Yankees fans. Yes. But I think he also gave us a pass. He's like, I get why the Yankees don't like me. I actually like them. Um well, you know, we have mixed feelings about him. There was the whole bloody sock thing, dude, and we, you know, appreciate gotcha. that. That was a stellar year for us as Red Sox fans. However, he came to Rhode Island and created a gaming company and contributed to the further bankruptcy of the state. So it's mixed he's feelings all around, dude. Yeah, he's done some mess up yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. I think that when you're in that limelight, I mean, look, I, I when this, this all started and he wrote that really, really long post – you could tell it was a dad who was pissed, and yeah. he spent a lot of time explaining that. Look, I've been in the public media for you know thirty years, forty years. This 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 sucks. And he took it to him, then he named him, mm-hmm. then he shamed him. And typically, I don't like that. But man, what those guys did was pretty vile. I mean, the number of people who sent that to me to say, "Hey, you, you you're a dad. You've got three daughters. What do you think of this?" I um. I wasn't terribly upset by it, which is interesting, right? So the context of it was. They, those guys went way, you know, it escalated way too fast, went way too far. Mm. I don't know, I saw at least one of them got fired from their job, too. I mean, like, he... Yep. Was he a pot? He was a podcaster? From Yan- Yankee Stadium. It's like, he actually worked at Yankee Stadium. He worked place. at Yankee Stadium. Really? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yes. There you go, actually, Mike. He actually yeah, worked at It's your representative <laughs> of your Yankees fans over there. <laughs> well, and I think another problem is just uh, th- this culture. It's like people don't realize that... That trash talking, the, the threats, they have a real world impact. Mm. It's like a lot of these kids today think that they can say these vile things. They can say these horrible because they're hiding behind their computer and they're they think they're hiding their right. identities. Well, I mean, we, we all know that's not necessarily true, right. but, but also yeah. because it's, there's no connection that what they're mm. saying online 
actually has real world repercussions. I'm going to murder you. They're not ever going to really murder that person. It's a form of speech for them. It's just a a, a threat. It's mm-hmm. just a way to troll someone. But people have been murdered because of these things. People have actually lost their say, lives. Yeah, people have crazies. actually been attacked. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's <coughs> where there's that real world threat. So those people, no matter what your intentions were, they still feel threatened. They still feel like uh, their lives are at risk, that their safety is at risk. And there's a disconnect between these trolls who don't understand that. Now, let me you ask know, a question, because if I remember this right, Schilling said, look, guys, here's the information. Those of you who know how to figure it out, go Go tell me who they are. Have at it. So did he, I mean, I don't think he uh, sat down and figured all this out. Who, who did his bidding? Was it somebody that, I mean, did he hire somebody to do it? Or was this people who kind of felt that he got wronged and they stepped in? Do we know? We can always and I guess maybe, does it matter? I don't know. Sorry, I'm on to the next story already in yeah. my mind. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. We, we can blame we can blame that hacker named Fortune. Exactly. I, I think so. It's like I mean, and he doesn't really have to speak. It's like his source code spoke for him. So um, that's just the way that is. I'm going to leave it at that. Well, see, right. I, think, I, think, I think we should have a debate. Right, Who's the North Koreans or the Chinese? That's right. Uh, it just matters no, it now. It was both in collaboration with each other. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> There's another issue in, intertwined with this, though, and that is... Hey, I that, you talk about NSA spying. And I'll keep it really short, but the, the other issue intertwined with this, I think, is a generational educational issue about the power of the Internet. Um, and those of us who are ex-gen, maybe a little younger, sort of understand it, but but those of us who have kids and are, are coming up... Well, some of us know the power of Grayskull. You're saying more Woo-hoo. powerful is the power of Internet. <laughs> exactly. This is, um, this is interesting. And we haven't taught the, the youth... Well enough. We haven't educated them mm. as to what the impact really is here. Yeah. I that's it. That's, that's my soapbox <clears throat> moment. No worries. I want to talk about the D-Link router vulnerability that was released. Oh, my God. No, wait, Paul. Is you that think? an internet could, of could things? Could you be specific, please? That is an invasive yeah. device. Yeah. Yeah. Right. D-Link router vulnerability. And it, 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 I'm going to... Is that like the snowstorm? There's, like, there's even more stuff for me to talk about that I maybe yep. haven't even talked about on the show before, which is just astonishing. First off, it was just astonishing to me that major vendors such as D-Link haven't caught on to applying security oh, to their yeah. devices. Well, they're uh, a networking company. Uh, yeah, so they're horrible <laughs> about they want speed, they don't want security. It's 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 not even it's it's not even that. It wait, goes so wait, much wait, wait, J- Jason, that's giving them way too much credit, dude. They are not <laughs> necessarily a networking company, in my opinion. Yeah. They're a gadget pushing company, maybe, but so the, this vulnerability is in the device's ping utility in its web interface, which allows for a command injection without authentication. So first off, the register article is actually inaccurate because that's actually two vulnerabilities rolled in one. That's authentication bypass and it's command injection. Right. Because you shouldn't be able to get to that page in the first place unless you have authentication. The other thing that I take issue with is not fully under... I mean, that's just one evidence of not fully understanding this vulnerability and some of the impacts. It says the company, D-Link... It shows there how immature they are and they're thinking about security. Recommends that users run encrypted wireless to prevent the low chance that passing hackers would break into the networks. <laughs> what? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So let's not talk about how you can go on Shodan and find thousands of D-Link routers that are exposed to the internet right. through the WAN connection. Because D-Link, that, that happens. You can ping from WAN. Let's also talk about that. Oh, by the way, if you've got an authentication bypass... That means, like, the rules of same origin and the rules of CSR, like, those don't apply, dude. That means everyone's got the password to your router, and it doesn't matter if your wireless is encrypted. I just need to trick you to click click, click on a link, and I own your router. And when I own your router, I own everything about you Mm -hmm. because I can quietly change your DNS servers. Right. Uh, that, that's where I was about to go. Man, yeah. Point heaven. to my point to my what DNS do you do? servers. Yeah, change the DNS and you point it to your own nice little malicious DNS. And that attack has over, been around baby. since like yeah. the beginning of this podcast, right? So that's how easy is it to automate that? Because and, and there very, was so like I'm gonna like I'm gonna give you an example. Several several years ago, there was an authentication bypass that happened in uh, Mexico. So it was a ISP in Mexico 
that uh, they figured out that the router that the ISP was giving people had an authentication bypass. They exploited the vulnerability through a mass phishing campaign, and they sent everyone malicious links, which changed their DNS servers, which pointed people to DNS servers that rerouted all of the major banks, like the top two or three banks in uh, one or two or three banks in Mexico, to servers that they owned. And they stole people's money. And, and that was, I want to say that was, six, that was six years ago. Had to be. Had to be. Yeah. You know, and the, what's interesting two, about that uh, is the, the two-wire routers. Yeah, it was two-wire. Well, Thank you, Carlos. Yes, it was two-wire. And, and, and the asymmetric nature of that is fascinating. So it's really easy to attack, but that cleanup becomes individual. Yes. And not oh, only yeah. that, it's very stealthy. What, what antivirus right. software is checking that your DNS server is changed on your router? Right. There's, there is none. Who's, right, looking so at talk- their, who's looking at their router? So, all right. So, security uh, folks listening to this, what does that mean? Then, does it mean if you're using D Link for your business, right? Smaller businesses are probably doing that. Right. They need to think about it. But then, does is this the kind of thing that we like? We always talk about security awareness, and, and we have a very misguided notion of what awareness is. But this seems like something might be worth talking to people about. Yes. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the awareness. So, the other thing the article says, Mike, is that the. Uh, person who discovered the vulnerability says the platforms the devices are built upon might be solid, such as OpenWRT. Right. They've had vulnerabilities too. Actually, most of the commercial routers do not run uh, OpenWRT or DDWRT. They run their own uh, brand of firmware. Right. He said, but then additional services are bolted on to provide value add, and security sure. seems to go straight out the window. I somewhat disagree with that in yeah. that the vulnerabilities that are present in most of these Soho routers have nothing to do with the complexity of features and everything to do with an extremely poor software development life cycle. A command injection in the ping vulnerability is something that on the commercial side in regular web application software, I think we're far more aware of, but that hasn't trickled down. This ping, so the concept of having a dialog box where you enter an IP address and you push a button that says ping has been around for more than 10 years. In fact, one of the original WT54G vulnerabilities was this insane vulnerability. It was a command injection in the ping functionality. Right. And I think it's ridiculous that they haven't matured enough to prevent these. This is low-hanging fruit vulnerabilities that can be well, easily Well, it almost prevented. sounds like then we're applying different standards to commercial to commercial grade, enterprise grade, than you know home use, right? Nope. You just nailed it, Mike. <laughs> no, I don't. No, it. we're not. Absolutely not. Well, the, the manufacturers. We would, seem we to would be. like the to. Be. We'd like to. No, we'd no, like we to, shouldn't, but I think the problems we have been. Well, we'd like to think. We'd like to think that this problem that we're looking at is just in Soho routers that people are using right. in their homes. It's not. Wait, in wait, fact, wait, I have wait, I have a slide wait. that shows these very same class of vulnerabilities: default passwords, command right. injection, authentication bypass, have been found by security researchers for several years now. In SCADA right. devices, in medical devices, Billy Rios, Terry McCorkle found it in a whole bunch of medical devices. Mm-hmm. They've been found in building automation, such as BACnet. There's a protocol that has absolutely no security on it. I They've know other people want to ask a question. How hard is it to fix for these vendors? Is it a simple fix? So I, I, it's a good question, Mike. I think for this point in time moving forward, right, if you were to pick a time in any of these embedded device manufacturers' uh, history and say, okay, I'm going to teach you how to implement security. I think the majority of them, 85%, would do it and probably not incur that much cost or really mm-hmm. have it impact their business in any way other than have it impact it positively. In fact, there was a student in my class that worked for a vendor who provides devices to industrial control systems. And he said, we've done all those things that you've been teaching us in the class, Paul. He said, we do, we do firmware signing. We do firmware encryption. We have a secure software development life cycle. We put secure things in our code. We obfuscate so that you can't reverse engineer it without uh, significant difficulty. All right, well, so stick, but he said stick the with problem me for a second is, here. So stick with me, Mike. Hold on, and then I'll let you talk. All right, and then, and then he, I'll stick with you. Okay, we're going to stick with oh, no, together. I'll stick with you, then you stick we're with gonna, me. We're we'll going stick stick to You know what? We're going to stick to each other. Um, we need a hug. <laughs> <laughs> so what he said was... He said, since we started doing that, he's like, our firmware we produce today is awesome. It's really secure. And I peppered him with questions. I'm like, yeah, did you seem like you're, you're really doing right? I'd like to use you as a case study. I think it's great. I said, what about all the firmware you, you produced before you had those standards? He's like, oh, the security is completely atrocious. We're having <laughs> trouble fixing it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's well, so, the problem, Mike. Sorry, that's right, a very so long-winded that, answer. And I, I think one other important point Sorry, is, hold on, hold on, Jason. Uh, I'm going to let Mike, Mike talk right. and then Jason. 
Well, all I was going to say is I was going to go back to it. So many times we say to people, oh, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't. You know, what would be interesting. What if we collaborated and put together like a, a quick, uh, you know, 100, 200 word email um, template. And, and then when we went back to our organizations to say, hey, if you've got a D-link, you need to send this message off. Because if they get, I don't know, anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand people sending them a note saying, hey, I've got a D-link and now I understand this and you guys need to do something about it. Right. Because I, I think at some point. There, we love to talk about awareness. We love to talk about education and all types of other things. But if we don't start to help consumers advocate for what they want, we can talk about it all we want, and that's right. great. But gosh, if these guys started getting flooding with articulate requests, I don't know. Maybe, maybe, no, maybe dude, I'm that's just exactly, myopic and I've spent too much time in the sun today. But no, that's exactly that was the funny. kinds of things that I want to promote and I think need to happen. Because like I said, we've yeah. been talking about these vulnerabilities on this show since we started 10 years ago almost. Well, well, just, well, here, just, just, just to amplify wants that, to help, I mean, do this. I'll, I'll help wordsmith it, and we can put it up on the wiki. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That would be great. I, mean, what, I just what need somebody to help some of the technology make sure I don't botch it. Yeah, I can certainly help but, with that. But the important thing about what Michael just said was, was it's not about um, uh, directly complaining at the company. It's about empowering the, the consumers that are buying these things to complain at the company articulately, and that's a big difference. Because they start yeah, looking at the bottom line, right? The, the mid, look, we can talk about DNS and poisoning and all sorts of stuff, and that's nice for us. But you know, if you want to go to a consumer, and I'm doing some of this on the fly, but if, if we went back to our organizations and said, would you like to, you know, how would you feel if you bought one of these wireless routers for your house and somebody could remotely, without you knowing it, change it so that when you went to do your banking, it took you to a site and stole all your money? They'd go, well, I don't want that. Okay, cool. Well, here's the people who are currently, you know, you might be at risk for this. And if you have one of these, here's an email you can send. And here's some steps you can take. We don't do that very often as an industry. But to me, that seems really beneficial. And it's not something that's terribly challenging for us to be able to do. So, you know, if I can do something that helps with that, uh, you know, I'm in. And you've got a fantastic distribution here already. So, I don't know. It's just... Thursday night thinking. That's what I want to do about this problem, Mike, because quite frankly, I'm somewhat tired of talking about it. It's really fun be for me because a lot of these embedded systems, it's hacking like it's 1999, right? right? And it's a lot <laughs> of fun. The attack surface is huge, right? It makes for great, like there's a class on it and everything. But I want to progress to the point where we don't, we don't need that, that we've right. educated the right people so that we don't have these problems anymore and we can move on to the next thing. And I tell you what, the problem is just going to get more complex. When we look at the internet of things, it is the problems that we have in securing mobile devices, it's the problems we have in securing embedded systems, and yep. the problems yep. we have with security in the cloud and the way that they all communicate with each other, they're going to tie together and that problem is only going to compound itself. So this embedded problem is just really one facet of the way technology is moving forward and how we're going to have trouble applying security to that model. In the same way, and so the, and when so we the had trick web is, servers so in 1997 we, we apply, that we couldn't secure. But I think yeah, but we want to apply. Factor. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. All I want to say is we want to apply pressure, but we don't want to just blame and shame because that's that's mm -hmm. only going to work no, so I, much. Yeah, so if we're going to empower consumers to understand better and articulate their concerns, then the flip side is to say, by the way, We'll help you, vendor. You come to us, we'll right, help. Right. We, we'll, we'll, and, we're, and we're not going to slap you around and mock you and, and publicly d debase you for it. We'll help. And it's not we're all interested. vendors either, right? I think the vendors can learn while they compete at a certain level. I think they can learn from each other. And I think the greater yeah. good should be the Security the tends not to be highly competitive, yeah. I but, but I Jason? also think another factor that, that we're overlooking is the users. It's like, I mean... How many of them are on the internet without patched Windows boxes? And we're talking about that now they have the onus of having to update the firmware on their routers. I mean, I've done a lot right. of war driving. I do it all the time. And you still see the default names of mm -hmm. Linksys, the, the, uh, the same default name for D-Link. You know that they have the same setup. It's like they're not updating and patching the, the devices now. So it's going to have to put – we have to put more pressure on the vendors to create a more automated updating uh, standard. Uh, it, it, and that's one of my top yeah. ten things that people that we can do to encourage people to secure embedded systems is not just automated updating, right? That's but right. one facet of it. It's secure automated right. updating. How yes. do I – there's no – in most embedded systems – now, some people are doing this, but most aren't. There's no validation that the firmware right. is the actual firmware. I mean, yeah, there's an MD5 checksum, but that – no, no, no. I mean, like – validation, right. signing of that firmware to make sure that it is the approved firmware for this device, similar right. to the way Microsoft signs its 
updates. I hate right. to say, but Microsoft's a shining example yes. of how an auto update process should work. They are. That hasn't been transferred to these embedded systems for which, well, which all crazy of your traffic is, it, is going through. It's not that complex. Exactly. I mean, well, again, right, you talk about hacking like it's 1999. We figured these things out 15 years ago. It's not that complex to do. It just requires somebody to sit down and say, hey, this is a requirement, and they've got to think it through at the beginning. It's a little tough yeah. to add at the end. Well, and informing right. a but user that they have to do it. I mean, how many consumers actually know that there are updates for their routers, that yeah. they need to update those now, routers? Jack, you used uh, to – said there's an Jack, awareness problem, Hold on, right? Jeff. Um, yes. Jack was trying to talk before, and Jack, you used to work for uh, a firewall company that was uh, yeah, so focused was, on small business, so – SMB. And mm -hmm. um, here's a challenge. What happens if uh, you enable automatic updates and it breaks something? Mm -hmm. It breaks it, yeah. Um, and if we're, you know, the devices we're talking about here um, are bricked and you throw them away and ship the customer a new one if it's under support, but nobody ever fills out the card or goes online. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what I, what I used to support um, was, you know, we had a channel distribution. It was, it was business, not home, although some people certainly use the free version at home. And uh, like everybody that pushes out patterns, whether it's endpoint protection, antivirus, uh, you know, intrusion prevention, next gen firewall, whatever, uh, eventually you'll uh, push out a patch that doesn't do what you want. And uh, when I was there, we had one that um, that made IPS a little overly aggressive, to put it mildly. And let's just <laughs> say it was not a good day for us. And, you know. Um, it was not catastrophic. Uh, once people figured it out, there was a there was a, a quick back on the back on the internet. Uh, you know, and there a couple of juggles and you were done. It didn't require reimaging systems. It didn't require you know. It wasn't one of the those uh, antivirus updates that uh, blew out key components of Windows that you needed to install this to fix. But you know what happens when you have a problem with a consumer device? You know, the consumer's off the internet. Um, they can't afford support calls at all. So they've got to, you know, you're talking about hacking like it's 99. Uh, we need to fix those problems without patching like it's 99. Uh, and I'll just say, you know, yeah. NT4, NT4 service pack 6A, <clears throat> right? You know, oh, you're me back. <laughs> so the, the old people, uh, or at least that have been doing this for long enough, just really shuddered. Um, thinking about what, what we used to go through in the NT4 days uh, when we patched systems, right? I mean, there was... See, the... The, the, the chicken the, population was, was uh, decimated by the number of uh, chicken sacrifices required when we were, you know, patching Exchange 5.5 five and NT4. Yeah, yeah Jack, you, you bring up a good point, Jack, because if you take the automatic update and you put it down to some of these devices, it would be the same thing as automatically updating your BIOS. If that goes wrong, your system doesn't boot. Guess what? Inside of firmware is your bootloader. And inside <laughs> of your firmware is your kernel. And, and so if that can't boot, okay, you know, on your system, if your operating system doesn't boot, you know, you can reformat. You can actually get another hard drive. You can restore a backup. Mm -hmm. Not a big deal. On an embedded system, that could mean, if you're lucky, it's taking a soldering thing and putting some JTAG or other kind of recovery on for, it for the and rebuilding consumer, the flash and for the average consumer that's not going to work now the scary the part is consumer it's you know it's best buy or home depot i mean best yeah. buy or lowe's or your on home a commercial depot or wherever you're buying the, the hardware you know, on a commercial staples. setting it's even scarier the vendors that are doing security when i talk about jtag they're like oh no those are just on our reference boards we <laughs> completely disable the the J right. we either remove it completely or we reverse mm. the pins so that oh, you have ouch. to like hardware reverse engineer to figure out like what they changed to make JTAG work. So they purposely obfuscate the hardware so that like only they can yeah. can rebuild the board. So that's another very that's scary like thing for good automatic speed hacking right there. Yes, I, mean, I Travis don't think good we speed need hacking. to start there yeah. though, Paul. I don't think we need to start there. I mean, one of the things that that would be a big step was just just to raise the awareness um, for starters. I mean, look look a residential user kind of community. They don't even know this thing's running software. They, yeah. They, they, yes. they look at their they look at their Linksys, D Link, you, you name it, vendor box, and they treat it as a toaster, right? I mean, it's it's a piece of hardware to them. So, if if these vendors built in software that at least would say would go out to home base and say, and do a check whether the, there's a vulnerability and just let the user know, that would be a huge step forward, even without patching. Just to say, look, no. there's a problem with this device. 
Uh, and here's how you rectify it. Go to see this web page at the vendor, and here are your options. That that'd be a huge step forward. So and, we look, and that's I mean, not so even automated to, patching. To but a so far, extent, what, it, what, is, what has been their ahead, Carl. economical motivation so far for them to do that? So right now, I haven't seen anything that would actually force these vendors to change their status quo to okay. We're chipping Bramble software. Yes, it's now impacting our numbers. Uh, let's start fixing this. So far, right. I haven't seen them impacted. Uh, so we have to look at how can we persuade them and mm -hmm. get the word out either to the users or, I don't know, uh, we have to find kind of a way to persuade them to uh, that this is something that they need to do because they won't do it for... The goodness of their heart. They no. need an economical reason for them to actually move on and say, okay, we're going to invest the money, we're going to hire the people, we're going to put in the QA processes, we're going to put the, inf the update infrastructure in place to do this, but they need a motivation, a business motivation to do it. I haven't found yeah, one. The, uh, Mike, not, well, no, it's, it's the unicorn. It's what I call, well, no, it's it's the top down bottom up approach, right? If we, you know, the thing is, we, we keep pretending that we're, we're bringing awareness and educating people by using jargon and concepts that they don't understand and, and then making it onerous for them in order to do something. But the, so the flip side is, then we in this industry sit around and, and we take shots at people who make mistakes. And, and I'm not saying they don't deserve it. But if you're in that environment and you're looking at your sales and your numbers are good and it's really not your problem because, you know, you made the patch available, well, you know, it's, it's kind of sensical. And so the, so the answer is a little bit of all of the above. Let's highlight the problems. Let's give the people the ability to articulate their concerns. Let's help them connect to the impacts, give them the ability to articulate that, and then say to the vendors, hey, by the way, here's what we're looking to do. And instead of just talking about what's wrong, let's talk about how to fix it. Let's. I mean, Paul, you just gave us a great example of a company that came to you and said, yeah, no, we figured it out. Here's what we're doing. Here's how it's going forward. Here's how it works. Hey, it's really good. You know, consistently in the last 15 years, we figured out anybody who considers security at the beginning of the process doesn't pay more for it at the end. In fact, mm. they end up saving money because they have less problems. Yep. Right. Great. Let's go amplify that stuff and say, hey, guys, you know what? We sound like we're shrieking about this sometimes, but if you involved us from the beginning, some of us would help you. You know, and Mike, you know who said those that exact statement in with respect to this smart? topic? It was, was someone extremely smart? smart. It was Bruce Schneier. Right, there you go. <laughs> yeah. He said something along the lines. I have a quote in one of my slides. He says, you know, if we don't start addressing this problem now and spending money to fix it now, it's going to cost us a lot more money down the road. Always, yeah. That's a prevention pound of cure. Yeah, naturally. I, it, to getting people to that point, I, like to call us this point, is extremely difficult right now, and I think that um, it, it's an interesting problem. To go back to the home router thing, so my home router dies, right? Right. Because I paid thirty-five dollars. D-Link makes a router. It's thirty-five dollars. I paid thirty-five dollars for my router. Wow. That router's only lasting you so long. Right. Like, it's exactly. gonna die. So you're gonna go replace it. What I want is when you go buy a new one, I want the security standard to, to be higher. You shouldn't have to go to the store and get something that's going to introduce all these vulnerabilities into your network. You should be able to go buy another 30, so $35, the, so $40 the, router. So I think about this. What, what you just laid out, and again, right, I'm not in the security awareness business, but most of the crap I see for security awareness is mind-numbing. And so imagine if, if we collectively started to talk about these things and gave people a scorecard and questions to ask and said, hey, here's the ones we recommend, and it really started to gain some steam. Wow, that's actually useful in an organization. And somebody in that situation looks at that, they come back to you, they figure it out. I mean, I just – I know it's a little utopian when we think about it, but I, I – no. To me, that it's giving people solutions for the problems that they have when they have them uh, to build that credibility and trust. Yeah, I actually say in my talk that I'm doing this year, I actually say part of the thing is for empowering the employees and educating the employees is to give classes to the employees on how to properly secure their home network, mm. how to Let secure me, their devices, how to uh, patch their systems. That's a great point. Because, Let me uh, – I, I just want to validate you because okay. I've done that. I've done classes – and we've said to people, hey, if you've got a home router, if you want, you bring it in. Right. We'll help you set it up in this course. We'll take an hour aside. We'll set I Everybody, <laughs> okay, I'm bringing it in. Exactly. But, but it's kind of like if you say to them, I'm going to teach you how to do a password. I'm not interested. Hey, how many of you want to learn how oh. people break passwords? Oh, I'm interested. Exactly. Right? 
So yes, employees Jason, are yes. Not, employees are not security conscious. Employees don't care about your data. They're never going to care right. about your data. Stop trying to teach your employees to protect your data. Teach your employees how to be security conscious regularly, how to uh, secure their what Wi-Fi at home, how protect to their protect uh, yeah. when their children, who their children are seeing online, uh, how to lock down their, their Facebook settings. Teach them regular things that make them more security conscious. And guess what? They go to work now more security conscious. They still don't care about your data, but now they're protecting it because just that's their natural habit now. Right. And, and, and I found that they do care about their data. You know, one more thing, too, I totally love about what data, you just yes. said. Yeah, well, and so, you know what I love? People always say, how do I teach my kids about Facebook? You know, this first thing you do, you let your kids teach you about Facebook. Right. You let your kids tell you everything they can figure and out. they're going to, yes. And then you turn around and say, cool, let's work together. Because, you know, we just said, well, people don't understand, and we talked about social media, and this younger generation doesn't understand some of these consequences. They're not going to like the lecture, but if we engage in an honest conversation where they can tell us what they know, what they see, now we can go have a mutual conversation, and we can share our experience. They can share theirs. We both get a little smarter for it. We need that same approach. Yes, Definitely. I know. We keep saying people aren't security savvy, but, but yeah, but you know what? They are. They are smart. Oh, they do they, care. No, no they're intelligent. They'll figure it out. That's yeah. one of the things I hate about talking about employees. You talk about employees is like, well, they're, they're stupid employees, stupid. Forget that. If you want to yeah, know how uh, creative and how determined your employees are, take solitaire off that computer. See how quick <laughs> that sucker comes back. If you want to see exactly how devious your employees can be, take solitaire away. Take Facebook off their off the proxy settings. See how quick that comes back. That's if how we start, yeah, I'm they're with you, motivated. Man. If we start they can solving do it. Their problems. If we start solving their problems in a way that they understand, uh, those problems go away, and and we gain their trust. They they gain our trust. We'll solve a lot more problems. I exactly. love it. Yeah, I've got a nine year old daughter. She's she's just like me, which should terrify the world. <laughs> and uh, and she is she is a hacker. She she will go through and she will find things. And I've learned different hacks from some of the things that she's done. It's like I mean she, it's created to see where they're going and how they're bypassing YouTube age restriction controls. You know, oh that's interesting. That's very you're grounded, but that was very interesting. So it's like, so you, you, you got to learn from them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh no, there's times now I have my kids teach me stuff. So it's yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. No, man, this is uh, I love it. That's great. Um can we talk about the NSA spying thing? Because I I'm curious your guys. Which take one? I, Please uh, take a number. We, before we go there, <laughs> before we go there, that's a great that's a great teaser. Um, I do want to mention that we were nominated for uh, best security podcast of the year. Woohoo! And uh, there is a survey online that you can go take. I put it out on social media. Uh, I'll put a, a link to it actually in the wiki. Chris, if we could if we could make that make that happen. Uh, maybe like the the main template. We'll get it, we'll get it up in the wiki so you'll be able to find it uh, easily. Now you do need to have a security blog or podcast in order to vote. Uh, that's the way uh, this particular voting works. So uh, if you do that, you can go vote and uh, and please go vote for us for best security podcast. We'd be is it is it wrong is it wrong to vote for ourselves? Um, <laughs> Just I you, you know there are podcast hosts who vote for themselves. I don't know anyone <laughs> who would do yeah. that. But, I'll know. stuff the ballot box for you. I'm good at that stuff. Yeah, you're like the I'm expert. No, we're not cheating. No, we're not. That's cheating. It. Well, it's hacking, but it's we'll, cheating, we'll which are the same thing. But no, <laughs> we're not hacking the survey. We're not cheating the survey. Just call it security <laughs> research you're covering. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So um, please go vote honestly, In unlike Jason, yeah. who hacks to contest. I'm going to enhance the survey yes. for you. No, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't do that. Hey, if you find an O'Day in Survey Monkey, dude, like you should win for like best <laughs> security podcast of the year. That would require it. me being technical. <laughs> so it's like so not going oh, to happen. Oh, bummer. <laughs> okay. So go ahead. You, might, you want to talk about the NSA? Well, yeah, I just I think it's interesting, right? So the headline and and this is the story that you pulled, right? It's official. NSA spying is hurting the US tech economy. China's backing away from the tech brands because of the NSA revelations. Um okay. It seems well, l seems like a little uh, hyperbole to me because uh it's all it's all politics and all it, it, economics. But uh, I don't know. Where we talk about the NSA, it's like I always have to bring up one thing just I have to I have to rant a little bit about and, and that's the whole all these things that we're getting all these revelations are from Snowden and stuff you know and everybody wants to talk about oh, we're releasing the NSA spying on this and we overlook the most common problem with this it's like screw all the revelations 
We know the NSA is spying. I'm paying my taxes so my government spy agency, you know, security agency will spy. That's part of their job. So we know that's going on. The problem is the National Security Agency had such lax security controls that a contractor <laughs> could walk out with all their data on a freaking USB to stick. They should do things I like, know. but they should do things like so put a passcode on their phone. Exactly. Like, exactly. Like, exactly. But no, that's what gets me. Though. Is like they're supposed to be security. <laughs> supposed, I know that they're stealing my secrets, and I, okay, that's great. You know what porn I look at. I don't want everybody else to know. Freaking keep that stuff secured. <laughs> it's like you know, it's like you you suck at keeping the secrets. You're really great at stealing them, obviously, but you really suck at keeping them. Yeah. That is the biggest tra uh, travesty and tragedy of that whole story. It's not that we got all these uh, revelations about all the different spying that they're doing. The revelation is the guy freaking was able to walk out of the building with them, and they didn't do proper security control. You've hit, like, fired up mode. I Man, exactly. Like, oh, when I get to there, no, you're buddy, past, like, you're past, well, He's, like, like hitting Whoa. this way on the Diet Pepsi, and that's... You've reached yeah. all, like when you're I done. It's triggers. epic. When you hear, yeah. it's like like super fired. <laughs> yeah, like super like, yeah. fired up level. It's like I'm getting. Diet yeah, that, that's what. He, NSA he's is about a trigger thirty word. seconds away from a diabetic coma. Nah, yeah. <laughs> oh, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> it's only my fifth liter now, so we're good. Fifth, you, all right, <laughs> give me some. I want some of Jason's. Uh oh. Uh oh. And that hug must have been a... Wow, dude, there's vodka awesome. in there. <laughs> no wonder you're so, fired up. <laughs> you weren't supposed to say is that, nothing, is dude. That better than your sidecars? <laughs> oh. uh, probably. My vodka vodka and Diet Pepsi is maybe what I should just stick with for now, mixing now cocktails. Now I have to bronze this bottle because it had Paul's lips on it. <laughs> I'll sign it <laughs> for you. It'll for me. It'll be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Lordy. Uh, oh. Next story. Next story. All right, I do, next. What do we do? I can run more. Time. Um, Quick, quickly. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, oh, my, my yeah, Jack, has a, Jack has an announcement story. It also, yeah. I just want to say Cryptia is, rants well on his blog. He's got his global yep. threat intelligence report for February, which is a good summary from someone who doesn't varnish things too much. And I, I do want to remind folks uh, that there are B-sides everywhere. Um, CFPs are open. Tickets available. Magic's happening. The, is the, the one CFP, that I spend a CFP lot of effort. open for Vegas, Jack? Vegas. Uh, the CFP has opened for Las Vegas. Okay. Besides, uh, we've besides Las Vegas, we'll host a track that is uh, run as a village by the folks from the Wireless Village that you know from DefCon and other places. So there's an, an another new track happening there. The call for. Um, papers for the proving ground that's the track where mm -hmm. we pair uh, new speakers with an experienced speaker mentor provide mentorship and help you uh, give your first uh, conference uh, speaking I just, experience i just had this relation with, jack since i no longer work in marketing i could i don't have to go to the black hat i can actually go to B-Sides Las Vegas. So, so B-Sides Vegas last year moved. We moved our dates and we are following the same. It's Tuesday, Wednesday. So if you need to do Black Hat, you can do a day of B-Sides and then two days of Black Hat or two days of B-Sides, a day of Black Hat. Um, awesome. Thursday is I'm free. Totally so submitted. if you're totally submitted. if you're doing if you're doing DEF CON, if you if you know you you're not paying for Black Hat, you can do two days of B-Sides and then catch the full four days of uh, DEF CON. So that's there. So you could uh, sign up for tri you could sign up for embedded device security assessments for the rest of us at Black Hat. Then you could go to B-Sides Las Vegas. Then you could go to DEF CON. Yep. That's right. That's a, that is that's a track. Right. That is a track. That's a track. Yeah. And so okay. uh, we're also call for volunteers is open. Security teams open. Logo contest for those who have artistic skills. So that's all bsideslv.org. But there are B-sides everywhere. Uh, Boston's coming up this spring. Um, Orlando's not. is just, what, a few weeks away. Well, Nashville, I, Baltimore, Puerto Rico. I mean, they're everywhere. I'm doing uh, Salt Lake City, actually. Uh, B-side Salt Lake Sweet. City at the end of March. Nice. Very good. That's a great crew, too. Cool. I mean, that's, they're, they're everywhere. With that, we're going to take a short break. Come back. Wrap up the show. Hold it. So we're just wrapping. Uh, thank you to uh, Jack and Joff and Carlos and Michael Santarcolangelo, our lovely guests. I love listening to you say that. Yes, you're all lovely. Yes. 
Do I say I your, even? Do I, I even say your name right, it. Mike? I don't. Not, I just kind of not even close. I just Santa. Santa is that better? Santa works. <laughs> Santa. We'll just we'll talk about pronunciation after the show. Someday. Yeah, I need before like, the sidecars. <laughs> yeah, I need like six more sidecars, and then I'd probably get it right. Thanks for a special <laughs> in-studio guest, Mr. Awkward Hugs himself, Mr. Jason Street. Did they make this in purple, or did it no, fade? No, dude. this was actually the that Def they didn't Con make that in purple. Shirt. Def yeah, Con, that I have that actually, same shirt. Yeah. That's one of my favorite Def Con yeah, shirts. I wear that to like family functions and stuff. <laughs> People are like, "What? Can you hold? Show the shirt on camera." I brought this directly for Stand you. Up, yeah, there, close your. Th- yeah, this, this yeah. was definitely specifically for Paul. My Con, favorite Def Con. Mine wasn't purple. You oh, faded it, that. The- yeah, you faded that. Yeah, sure. it's awesome. It's awesome. Nice. Well, thanks, everyone. We'll see everyone next week. Thanks for listening. Don't forget wiki.securityweekly.com. Go there and check out the link to vote for Security Weekly in the best security podcast for the year at the RSA Security Blog Awards. And don't forget to enter a phone phone. That's in the wiki as well. This is actually Jason's. I'm going to actually give it back to him. Thanks, everyone. And over and out. Awkward hugs. Bye. Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> what is that?